Adam was hungry. He had had a long, challenging day naming the animals. His afternoon nap had been refreshing, and his post-siesta introduction to Eve was exhilarating, to say the least. But as the sun began to set on their first day, Adam discovered he had worked up quite an appetite. I think we should eat, he said to Eve. Let's call the evening meal supper. Oh, you're so decisive, Adam, Eve replied admiringly. I like that in a man. And supper has a nice ring to it. I guess all the excitement of being created has made me hungry too. As they discussed how they should proceed, they decided that Adam would gather fruit from the garden and Eve would prepare it for their meal. Adam set about his task and soon returned with a basket full of ripe fruit. He gave it to Eve and went to soak his feet in the soothing current of the Pishon River until supper was ready. He had been reviewing the animals' names for about five minutes when he heard his wife's troubled voice. Adam, could you come here for a moment? What seems to be the problem, dear, he replied. I'm not sure which of these lovely fruits I should prepare for supper. I've prayed for guidance from the Lord, but I'm not really sure what he wants me to do. I certainly do do not want to miss his will on my very first decision. Would you go to the Lord and ask him what I should do about supper? Adam's hunger was intensifying, but he understood Eve's dilemma. So he left her to go speak with the Lord. Shortly, he returned. He appeared perplexed. Well, probed Eve, he didn't really answer your question, he said. What do you mean? He, did he say anything? Oh, yes, replied Adam. But he just repeated what he said earlier today during the garden tour. From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. I assure you, Eve, I steered clear of that forbidden tree. But that doesn't solve my problem, said Eve. What should I prepare for tonight? From the rumbling in his stomach, Adam was discovering that lions and tigers are not the only things that growl. So he said, I've never seen such crisp, juicy apples. I feel a sense of peace about them. Why don't you prepare them for supper? And maybe while you're getting them ready, you'll experience the same peace that I have. All right, Adam, she agreed. I guess you have more experience at making decisions than I have. I appreciate your leadership. I'll call you when supper's ready. Okay, replied Adam, relieved. I'll get back to my easy bank. Adam was only halfway to the river when he heard Eve's call. He was so hungry that he jogged back to the clearing where she was working. But his anticipation evaporated when he saw her face. More problems, he asked. Adam, I just can't decide what I should do with these apples. I could slice them, dice them, mash them, bake them into a pie, a cobbler, fritters, or dumplings. Or we could just polish them and eat them raw. I really want to be your helper, but I also want to be certain of the Lord's will on this decision. Would you be a deer and go just one more time to the Lord with my problem? Since he didn't have any better solution himself, Adam did as Eve requested. When he returned, he said, I got the same answer as before. From any tree of the garden, you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. Adam and Eve were both silent for a moment. Then Adam said, you know, Eve, the Lord made that statement as though it ought to fully answer my question. I'm sure he could have told me what to eat and how to eat it, but I think he wants us 
to make those decisions. It was the same way with the animals today. He just left their names up to me. Eve was incredulous. Do you mean that it doesn't matter which of these fruits we have for supper? Are you telling me I can't miss God's will in this decision? Adam explained, the only way you could do that is to pick some fruit from the forbidden tree. But all these fruits are all right. Why, I suppose we could just eat all of them. Adam snapped his fingers and exclaimed, say, that's a great idea. Let's have a fruit salad for supper. Eve hesitated. What's a salad? One of the key passages that we have gone to several times in our series on God's will is Ephesians 5, 15 through 17. Here's what it says. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. This verse tells us that It is not just an automatic thing. If you are a Christian, you are not necessarily automatically going to walk as a wise person. It is possible for Christians to walk as fools. So the admonition here is to be very careful to walk as a wise man. And that is dependent on knowing what the will of the Lord is. And so that brings us to the question of how do we understand what the will of the Lord is? We've talked about the differences between the sovereign will of God and the moral will of God. We've spent considerable time on many ways that Christians often employ for trying to discover the will of God that are not reliable and may lead us in the wrong direction. And so tonight, I want us to examine what I believe to be the biblical way of wise decision-making. The Bible's answer for knowing God's will boils down to one rich word, the word wisdom, wisdom. The Bible speaks much about wisdom, especially in the book of Proverbs and the rest of the wisdom literature. But it really talks about the importance of wisdom all the way through the Old Testament and into the New Testament. And from various perspectives, wisdom is also seen in Scripture as discernment, insight, discretion, prudence, and understanding, depending on the context. Stuart Scott gives a definition of biblical wisdom as knowledge of God's word practically applied to a holy end. Another author said that wisdom is the practical use of biblical truth. You see, just because you know something does not necessarily mean that you are wise. First of all, it makes a difference what you know. The Bible distinguishes between godly wisdom and the wisdom of men. Godly wisdom comes only from what God has revealed. But even if you know the truth that God has revealed, you're not really wise until you apply that to your life. I mean, how many Christians do you know who have a lot of Bible knowledge but are not applying it effectively in their lives? And we all know people like that. But that's why the Bible warns us that a little knowledge alone will do what? It will puff us up, right? It will make us prideful. But true biblical wisdom is applying the truth that God has revealed to our everyday lives. And so the real question that we need to answer tonight is, how can we have the wisdom of God 
How can we have God's wisdom? How can we apply the truths that God has revealed to us in our everyday living? What is the biblical perspective on this? Well, first of all, let me just very quickly back up for a few minutes and revisit uh, those two aspects of God's will that we talked about. How do we know the sovereign will of God and how do we know the moral will of God? In terms of the sovereign will of God, we know it through his word by looking back at, uh, we know it through his word and by looking back at what has happened in history. And when I say uh, we know some of it by looking at God's word, there are certain aspects of God's sovereign will that he has revealed to us in his word. In a sense, the story has already been written. There are some future events that we know are going to take place because God has told us that they will take place. This is generally what we refer to as Bible prophecy. So some of the sovereign will of God we know in advance because God has given it to us in his word. We also can see it through providence. We can't know that ahead of time, but we can know by looking back and seeing what God has done. And as we look back and we see what has happened, we know that Scripture says that he works all things according to the counsel of his will. We read that a few minutes ago. We can therefore know that if something happens, that it is part of the sovereign will of God. And so these are the two ways that we know God's sovereign will. And remember, you generally cannot know the sovereign will of God in advance other than the things that God has revealed to us in the form of prophecy. So we shouldn't be getting all consumed with trying to know the sovereign will of God. This is the secret will. The secret things belong to the Lord. And so we don't need to fret over those things. What about the moral will of God? And we've spent a lot of time on this. The moral will of God is known exclusively through Scripture. Psalm 119.105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It's how we are to live. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness or in the right way, so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. 2 Peter 1, 3 says that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellent excellence. The word of God is sufficient for our daily living. We don't need to turn to any other source. We have all we need to live a life of godliness. And as one author put it, so that we could know his will, God gave us the Bible, along with a mind capable of reason, which he expects us to use. He has given us all the truth that we need in Scripture to make wise decisions in the course of life. And let me just say something very forcefully here tonight. You've got to decide whether or not you believe God's word is totally sufficient. You have to decide about that. If you do believe that it is, then you will not make attempts to supplement it with other things, such as psychology or human philosophy. If you really believe God's word is totally sufficient. You will turn to it as your source of truth. And when it comes time to make important decisions, you will turn to the scripture, its precepts and its principles as the lamp to guide your feet. 
And we may deal more later on with the sufficiency of Scripture. I haven't decided yet how long I'm going to extend this little series. Uh, I've got a few other things up my sleeve that I might uh, pull out uh, on this. But, but let me tonight just give you some key presuppositions for biblical decision-making. And I want to start off just by reading straight through these without making many comments on them. These are presuppositions in regard to making wise biblical decisions. Number one, we do not need to know God's sovereign will and how he is providentially bringing it about before we make a decision, okay? We don't have to know that ahead of time. Can't really know that ahead of time. But that's where we have referred to Deuteronomy 29, 29 over and over again. Number two, the Holy Spirit's role is to convict, teach, and conform us all through the vehicle of the Word of God. That's John 16, 8 and John 17, 17, thy word is truth. Third, God only guides or leads his people today, first, by providence, and we only know this after the fact, Proverbs 21.1, or by scripture, and we can know it, of course, before we act, Psalm 73.24. Number four, God is a gracious God who has provided us everything we need in order to do what he wants us to do. That's 2 Peter 1.3. Number five, God holds us responsible to search out and follow his moral will, God's written word, in all of life, 2 Timothy 2.15. Number six, if we make a decision based on biblical commands and principles alone, we can fully trust that we are pleasing God in our decisions and fully trust that he will providentially by circumstances out of our control, change our choice if it is not within his will. And you see some scripture references there. I think all of this is on the screen. And again, I'm just kind of marching through this. These are all presuppositions. Number seven, to rightly interpret and apply the word of God, we must use a prayerful, literal, historical contextual and grammatical method of studying it. This is a good hermeneutic. And we have scripture references there as well. Number eight, no one is ever outside God's sovereign plan. God is sovereign over all. It's impossible for us to be outside his ultimate sovereign plan. And then number nine, every believer needs pastoral oversight and the body of Christ to help him stay true to God's word. This is all God's design for wise decision-making. We're going to flesh this out a little bit, but I wanted to just kind of march through those so you just see them all, and you, I'm sure you didn't get all those down. You can come back to the archive, right, and uh, check it out again later. But I want us to come back now and examine this a little more closely. What is the correct biblically-based perspective on how to make wise decisions? What is the procedure that we should follow as we attempt to understand what the will of God is? What are the principles for a biblical approach to knowing God's will? Dr. Wayne Mack gives the following principles. We're not going to get to all of them tonight, but we'll get a couple of them here. First of all, number one, to make wise decisions, you must make them in keeping with what your main goal in life is. You've got to make decisions based on what your main goal in life is. Now, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, what should be your main goal in life? 
Well, Revelation 4.11 says, Worthy are you, O Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and because of your will, they existed and were created. Every decision that you and I make, we should begin by asking the question, is this something that will bring honor and glory to the Lord? Is it something that will bring honor and glory to the Lord? If our main goal in life is to bring glory to God and honor to Christ, then every decision we make should reflect that goal. We're to follow the example of Christ himself. In John 12, 27 and 28, he said, Now my soul has become troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Jesus said, that's why I'm here. I'm here to glorify the name of the Lord. And if suffering is part of glorifying your name, then bring it on. Do we have that same attitude and desire to glorify God no matter what the cost? In John 17, Jesus said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify glorify you. It's all about glorifying God. Jesus was saying the whole purpose for which I came was to glorify you, and in glorifying me, you're going to be glorified as well. In John 14, 13, Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, I will do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Everything Jesus did, his goal was to glorify his Father. And Jesus said, I'll answer your prayers if your motivation for praying is that the Father might be glorified. Is this our goal? Is this our main goal in life? In in Romans 3.23, we have a very interesting definition of sin. And you know this verse. It says, for all have sinned and what? Fall short of the glory of God, right? What is sin? It's falling short of glorifying God. That's what makes sin so horrible. It doesn't glorify God. It's not just that it's wicked and evil and that it hurts other people. Yes, all of that is true. But more than that, it glorifies self instead of God. And we were created to glorify God. But when we sin, we don't glorify God. Exalting self above God makes sin especially heinous because we are not worthy to be glorified as God is. He alone is worthy of glory and honor. Ephesians 1.6 speaks of the purpose for which God saves us. Now, we looked at that passage a few minutes ago in Ephesians 1. We read the entire uh, passage and so we get some of this in context. But in verse 6, it says, To the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. Verse 12 says, To the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. Verses 13 and 14 read this way. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance (coughs) with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, notice, to the praise of his glory. That's why he saved us. It's all for the praise of his glory. It was so that we would give glory and honor to him forever. It's not just so that we 
get to go to heaven when we die. Of course, that's a benefit for us, but his purpose for saving us was to glorify his own name. You see, it glorifies God when a vile, rotten sinner is changed and his life begins to reflect the character of God. But the bottom line for us, as far as the topic of guidance, is that we should have a theocentric perspective in all of life's decisions. We should first and foremost ask the question, will this glorify God or not? Will it glorify God or not? That's the first point at which we should begin to ask questions. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Even in the most mundane things of life, even in deciding what you're going to have for supper, right? Right? even in regard to such things as what you eat or drink, in every decision you make along the way, do it all for the glory of God. This is the starting point in biblical decision-making. We should begin by asking ourselves the first question in the Westminster Catechism, which is, what is my chief end? What is my chief end? We should get up and remind ourselves every morning that the primary reason for living is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That is our purpose. So when it comes to wise biblical decision-making, that's where it it all starts. It all is about God's glory. Secondly, to make wise decisions, you must be consciously guided by a biblical value system, a biblical value system. The decisions you make are closely related to the values you hold. In 2 Corinthians 4.13, Paul said, we believe, therefore we speak. In other words, our faith system shapes what we say and also what we do. What we really believe will manifest itself in what we talk about and in how we live our lives. What we say we believe doesn't really reveal itself until it's revealed through patterns of speech, but it's what we talk about and what we say that reveals what we truly believe. And that would also be the same about our behavior. What we actually do really reveals what we truly believe. In James 2.14, James says, What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but has no works? Can that faith save him? What's the answer to that? No. That kind of faith is not true saving faith. That kind of faith will not save. If your faith does not manifest itself in righteous works according to God's word, you don't have true saving faith. There are a lot of people who are saying that they have faith, but they don't have a changed life to back up their claim. And so he says in verse 17, even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. If you really do believe, it will manifest itself in your works. And if it doesn't manifest itself in your works, then you don't really believe it. A person's values determines his lifestyle. And what you really believe will reveal itself in what you do and in what you say. You know, people are always talking about the importance of application. You hear this all the time. You go to pastor's meetings and conferences. 
many times they, there are some who even elevate application above sound doctrine. But doctrine is just as important, if not more so, because people live out what they truly believe. And I'm not, of course, minimizing the importance of application. All good expository preaching should include application. But I do believe that doctrine is in itself application because if what you believe is according to God's will as revealed in his word, then you're going to live according to those beliefs. Your beliefs will determine how you live. That's why it is so important, folks, to have biblical values, values that are formed by Scripture itself. Now, what are some of the values that you and I as Christians should hold? Let me just give you a few of these. Number one, personal growth in grace, personal growth in grace. 2 Peter 3.18 says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So one of the questions that I am going to ask myself when I have a decision to make is I'm going to ask, will this help me grow in grace or will it hinder me in some way from that? For example, there are certain occupations that might hinder rather than enhance my spiritual growth. Some jobs might not allow me to to attend church, and I would have to forsake the assembling together with other believers. And so we need to ask that question. Will taking this job hinder my spiritual growth? There are certain places that I could move to where there might not be a Bible teaching church, and that could hinder my spiritual growth. And so we have to ask those kinds of questions. Another important value is godliness. 1 Timothy 4, 7 says we are to discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness. And what that text means is that we should orient our lives around the pursuit of godliness. That should be our goal. So when we have a decision to make, we should ask, will this help me become a more godly person? If not, it might not be a wise decision. 1 Timothy 6, 11 says that we're to pursue godliness. That's a very strong word. We're to run after it, diligently pursue it. Matthew 5, 1 through 12 says that we are to value, thirdly, Christian character qualities, Christian character qualities. If I make this decision, is it demonstrating poverty of spirit? Is it demonstrating meekness? Will it help me in the area of hatred of sin? Or will it encourage me to love sin? Will it help me in the area of purity of heart or hungering and thirsting after righteousness, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to ask that kind of question. Another important Christian value is worship. John 4 says, the Father seeks worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. So in making decisions, I should ask if this is an act of worship or will this Help me in terms of my worship. Will this enhance my ability to worship the Lord? This is a value that we're to hold. Another important value is that of marriage and family. Will this decision affect my marriage in some way? Will it make it stronger? Will it enhance my marriage or hinder it? Is this demonstrating loving my wife as Christ loved the church? Is this demonstrating submission to my husband for the sake of Christ? Is this helping me to fulfill my responsibilities to my children? Another value 
is Christian fellowship. Christian fellowship. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. This is a value, an important value that we are to have, that of Christian fellowship. So as we make decisions, we should ask ourselves how this decision is going to affect our ability to have fellowship with God's people. Will it enhance fellowship or will it hinder it? Another value should be ministry or service. Mark 10.45 says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And in Galatians 5.13, Paul wrote, For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Serve one another. And so I need to ask the question, is this a way of serving others? Will this enhance my ability to serve the body of Christ, or will it hinder that? And then there's the value of evangelism. 1 Corinthians 1.33, Paul wrote, Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many, so that they may be saved. Paul says that every decision that he makes is filtered through the filter of whether or not it will profit the many so that they may be saved. It's a priority of evangelism. So one question we should ask ourselves as Christians when we make a decision is, will this help other people come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? How will this impact my witness for Christ? And this is why we are here as believers. That's why God hasn't taken us home already. He's left us here for this reason. This should be a high priority in our lives. Another Christian value ought to be peace with others. Peace with others. Romans 12, 18 says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Romans 14, 19 says, so then we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Ephesians 4.3 says, we're to be diligent to pres- persevere, excuse me, preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Colossians 3.15 says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. So another value that will help us in making wise biblical decisions is the value of keeping peace in the body of Christ. We should ask ourselves, will this decision help or hinder peace in the body? Will it build up the body or will it tear it down? Will it cause division and strife? If so, I should not do it. Now, this doesn't mean that I should abandon truth in order to maintain unity, but it means that if the truth of the gospel is not at stake, and this is a preference issue, I should yield my rights and privileges for the sake of keeping peace. This is part of wise biblical decision-making. And then some of the values that we ought to hold as Christians come from the better than passages that we find in the book of Hebrews, I mean, the book of Proverbs. There are some statements in Proverbs that say it's better to have this than to have that. It's better to do this than to do that. These are values that we should hold as God's children. What are some of these better than passages? And I'm running out of time, so I'll cut this short. One of them is Proverbs 15, 16. It says it's better to have a little with the fear of the Lord 
than great treasure and turmoil with it. In other words, it's better to be poor and obey God than to disobey God and to be rich. Why is that? Well, because turmoil comes with disobeying God. It might come in the form of guilt. It might come in the form of worry. It might come in the form of fear or anger or bitterness or discontentment. But there's going to be turmoil when you're not in close fellowship with God as a result of your disobedience. So it would be better to be poor and have the fear of the Lord than to be rich and have that turmoil that comes from disobeying God. And not only is this true in regard to our relationship with God, it's also true in our relationship with others. Proverbs 15, 17 says, better is a dish of vegetables where love is than a fattened ox served with hatred. It's better to be poor and have loving relationships with people than to be rich and have discord. And there are many of these that we could go through, and these are included in my book, uh, Proverbs 19.22, it's better to be a poor man than a liar. Proverbs 21, verse 1, a good name is to be more desired than great wealth. Favor is better than silver or gold, and on and on we could go. Well, this is just the beginning tonight. We, we just kind of gotten started in this, and I think we're probably going to take a few more weeks, weeks on this, and I may even branch out and chase a few rabbits uh, before we're all uh, done with this series. Let's pray together. Father, we uh, thank you tonight that uh, you have given us what we need for life and godliness, that uh, we have everything in your sufficient word. We don't have to supplement or add to uh, your truth in any way. You have given us all that we need. Help us to be good students of your word. Help us to be wise in this life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.